Okay, this recording, okay. And then I'm going to go. Oh, yeah. Remember, it's a Zoom platform. Welcome, everybody. Here we are, allies of the manor. And our program continues, though probably most of us would rather be outside because this is a rare moment in November. Now, often we call September Indian Summer. We're probably going to have to change that name soon enough. We'll call, we'll call it the, the warm breeze after August or something to that effect. But now we're in November, and this, this, we'll call this the imported Chinook from Alberta. That might be a better word. And so we're, we're in an exciting time this week, and we get to the town, we'll hear a bit more about it a little later. But next week, just in case you forget, we're going to have um, baking with Oma. Now, Oma's not going to physically be here, but she gave me her recipes, and she's going to help me by phone actually make them. And I'm going to make them ahead and also have some finishing off so we can do a bit like the galloping gourmet and have three stages of cooking in process. So it looks as if it all happened in about five seconds. And then we also get to hear from Marie Nickel next week, who will show us and uh, tell us all the stories of Newfoundland mittens. And you say, what are Newfoundland mittens? You may say, well, that's why you need to check in next week to find out more about that. For Newfoundland, well, of course, New Newfoundland is what invented on version of mittens, but it's colder there, definitely. And so I'm going to welcome to our wonderful podium, our illustrious Susan Johnson. Who will tell us a bit more about why we're here today anyways. Hi, guys. Our special guest speaker today is uh, Betty Kelman, who has a long, illustrious career in nursing, which she tried to retire from, but she reconnected. <laughs> so she's going to tell us a little bit about nursing, because nurses, all healthcare professionals like that, have been in the news for the last several months. Just an idea on um, what all is involved with the happy Hello, and uh, we can't see you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Deborah will appreciate that. Deborah was a colleague who spoke at meetings and she always needed the footstool. You only saw the top of the head. So we're we can be challenged. So thank you for inviting me here today. Um, and I have been thinking of who I could dedicate this PowerPoint to. Uh, I was asked to speak a little bit about um, my career as a nurse, and then I decided I'd expand it. I wanted to dedicate this to someone, and I wasn't sure I who I should dedicate it to. Um, there are a couple of people on the Zoom meetings that maybe represent people you should dedicate it to. Angela? Angela, I met first when I cared for her daughter. Oh, oh sorry. Yes, how's that? Better? Is that better? Can you hear me now, Pat? Yeah. One second. You know what? I didn't turn the house system on, so I'll do that. Oh. Okay. Um, <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll try from this side. How's that? Yeah. You can look. We can't see you. Huh? We can't see you, Bet. That's a good thing, Bet. <laughs> Try again. Okay, have you seen and heard? Yes. Hello to the people. Hi. Hi, Angela, can you see me? Yes, I can, Lynn. Okay. We'll get there. We'll get there. Somehow. <laughs> hey, Angela, you know that best. Oh, yeah. 
<laughs> try and try again. Okay. That's one, two, three. Can you hear that? That's one, two, three. That's one, two, three. Okay. Okay. All right. Give it a try. Thank you. Okay. Okay, Pat. How's that? It's better. Okay. I will try to project. So I was mentioning that I would like to dedicate this to people. Angela I first met when I cared for her daughter, Rita. And is it okay if I share a little bit, Angela? Yeah, sure. Rita was diagnosed as a very young girl with a type of kidney disease and wasn't given much hope for survival. Rita beat the odds. Now, she didn't beat the odds because all the medical teams at Sick Kids and Toronto General were good teams. I firmly believe she beat it because of her family. Angela was the best advocate, the caregiver. And how long did, did um, Rita live to, Angela? 26 years. 26 years. And she was supposed to go when she was, what, four or five? No, three. Three, three. So I think that I'd like to dedicate this both to patients like my friends Rita and Angela. And Angela and I have had a lifetime relationship. Um, mm on the, we used to call the therapeutic relationship in nursing, but sometimes that's okay. And I learned a lot of strength and a lot of courage. Like that's full volume on my phone and I can barely hear her. Yeah, hold for a minute while we work on a top levels again. Okay. You stay where you are. Because what, what, what I realize isn't happening, we can hear you in the room, but we're not hearing you in the Zoom, okay? okay? And we need to hear you. One second, everybody, okay? There we are. Just call me uh, uh, the Wizard of Oz. <laughs> Something like that. If you asked me a year ago how to do this, I would have said, You're mad. <laughs> You're mad. I gotta turn this off. That's good. And you me. Now. Okay, so what are you gonna do? Okay, that's what happens. No, no, David. Yeah. You have to address the source. Um, no, I don't. Sorry, automatically plugged in. Uh, let's see. There. Okay. And can you talk now? I'm going to go see Mary Ann. Okay. Can, uh, can, uh, we're going to just check with, our, um, with Mary Ann in the office to see if the sound is reaching Zoom. Angela, can you hear it's me? It's reaching me. It's reaching me. Yes, I can see you. I can hear you. Okay. I think we're, we're getting there. You are. <laughs> yeah, somehow. <laughs> Eddie, your mic was muted. It's not muted anymore. That's a good thing. Good thing. I'm muting yeah. mine again, though. Yeah. You used to try to keep me quiet at work, so it's working now. Okay. Are we ready to roll? Okay, so I'll get back to my dedication, which is really to the patients and the families that I worked with. In Montreal some years ago, a book was published about heroes. And these heroes were the people who lived with kidney failure and dialysis. And the hospital at that point said, you know what? These are the people, these are the ones who lead the way. And these are our heroes. And so my work was with heroes. Now, my other special guest on board is Deborah Appleton, who's a longtime colleague of me. And uh, I was a clinical educator when I first met Deborah. It was after the merger of the Toronto Western and Toronto General Hospitals into the University Health Network. 
Deb was Toronto General, I was Toronto Western. Need I say anything more? <laughs> um, but Deb was one of my uh, orientees that I had to teach about new techniques. Oh, and she was terrible. She questioned everything. She had a brilliant mind and questioned everything. And why did we do it that way and not that way? And we were trying to bring techniques together. But you know, there is a divine justice in the world because when I left my position as clinical educator, guess who took over? Deborah often talked to me about some of the complex students she then inherited. So there is justice in the world, but Deb went on to do a fantastic job and excelled and, and really led past me. So those are two people that I will dedicate it to. And the final dedication um, I have to make today, I heard word today uh, from one of my colleagues, uh, former colleagues at work that um, one of our other colleagues who worked with us in the 80s and returned to Greece to put dialysis and nephrology on the map there has passed away from COVID pneumonia. So to Nick Dombros and to all the doctors and all the workers in healthcare, those who are on the front line, to all of us, to all of us living with COVID, this is dedicated. We're in church, I'm going to bring in with a prayer and this is a nurse's prayer and then I'll start the PowerPoint. Lord, give me grace on this and every day to do my work the best, not simplest way. And to remember that in all I do, the very smallest task is seen by you. Grant to me courage, Lord, when things go wrong, to stop and think and not rush blindly on. And though the task may not seem fair, remember, I remember that thou too art there. Give me a humble heart that I may know that things worthwhile are not just things that show. For thou, efficiency and skill mean much. The greatest gift of all is human touch. Fill me with love that I may realize the suffering and the pain that round me rise. And grant each day that I may seek to share the burden of the people in my care. Lord, give me strength to help me play my part, to make my work the essence of my heart. And show me patience and true kindness, Lord, that I might spread thy radiance through my ward. So when at night I come back to my rest, I pray that I may feel I've done my best. And Lord, at times I know I forget thee, but please forgive and always be with me and be with you. Do one more thing so we can see your beautiful face. There we go, okay. Wow, there you go. <laughs> yeah, there's your pop and everything. Okay, and um, I think we're ready to start the official talk. Okay, we're ready to share, share, share the screen? Share the screen, please. It's, it's coming. <laughs> I, I did tap dancing at the age of five. Perhaps I should try to do some tap dancing. Well, I'm not sure. I, don't, I don't know if I can still do that, though. Well, I used to do a lot of speaking, and I've got to admit, my favorite was when we first got uh, the kind of thing like PowerPoint, and I did a wonderful presentation with all kinds of pictures on it, and I was going to do Friday Grand Rounds for Toronto, and I was doing a talk to a group of people at Sunnybrook and Toronto Western, Toronto General, et cetera, and the PowerPoint failed. 
And so mm. there I was left with this wonderful talk where I was going to be saying, and in this picture we see, and in this, so I would say, well, in this picture you would see this if I were to describe it for you. So it looks like uh, that might be a potential. You never know. We're getting there. We're getting there. We're getting that. I, I think the first talk I ever gave, I thought I'd be very brave and I was at a podium in St. Joseph's and I had a presentation ready and voila, they turned the lights out and there was no light, but I thought, okay, well, I'll turn the light on the podium, but there was no light and I was going to read my notes. So that was another corker. That, that was a fun one too. So we're just going to put this onto slideshow and uh, yay, we got it. Hooray. Well done, John Joseph. Thank you. So this is Adventures in Nursing. And what I decided to do, because I'm also very fond of history, is I thought I'll write a little bit about the history of nursing. It's uh, very close to me, as you'll see. And um, I also put another couple of my heroes on this slide. You'll see Florence Nightingale. Anybody here Florence Nightingale? What was she famous yeah. for? Dancing. Yeah, and where did she get her start? Crimea. Crimea War, yeah, which is around 1853, 1854, 55. The other woman I'm going to talk to you about is not as well known. Her name is Mary Seacole, and she is also a nurse from the Crimean War. She originally came from Jamaica. So I want to talk about these two people as heroes that I learned about. Now, I'm going to make an admission here. When I was speaking one day, uh, Deb knows this, I often would include Florence Nightingale quotes in my talks because I really like Florence Nightingale. And at the end of one talk, one of the younger people in the audience put her hand up and said, Betty, you always talk about Florence Nightingale. May I ask, were you a classmate of hers? <laughs> sure. So that's when I decided nursing history needs to be taught. There's a, there's a big gap out there for young nurses, so we need to make sure they know it. And I'll go on to the next slide, please. So we can do the official definition of nursing. This is from the International Council of Nurses. It's a more recent one and it's very wordy, but it encompasses a lot of what nurses do, which is the care of families, groups, communities, sick or well, looking after the ill and the dying, advocating for safe environments, helping educate, helping teach. And these are some of the roles of nurses as we'll see. And I'll go on to the next slide, which of course is a quote by Florence Nightingale. Now Florence Nightingale was a young woman, a Victorian woman who was of wealthy parentage, and she elected to spend 10 years arguing with her family why she should become a nurse. It was a vocation for her. She chose not to marry because if she had married in the Victorian age, she would have lost her privileges and rights, and she knew that. For her, nursing was an art. And as this says, it was to be made an art and it requires as exclusive a devotion as hard a preparation as any painter or sculpture's work for what is having to do with the living body if not treating it as the temple of God's spirit. She was very religious. She carried her faith through and it carried her through many, many years. But that was her definition of nursing. We'll move on to the next slide. And here's the young Betty Kalman on graduation day. Uh, yeah, traditional nurse, got the cap on. First time I got to wear the black band on my, my cap. Um, I have a personal interest in nursing that I'll discuss, and that's my objective today, as well as discussing the history of nursing. And I may share some stories from my personal paths along the way. Along the next note, we carry on to the next slide. Now, you can see why it's better I went into nursing and not artwork, um, because that was not something I was skilled at. But I probably drew this in grade three or so. My dad died around that time when I was eight, and that was my first exposure to hospitals and so on. And I, uh, I drew the picture and I wrote, when I grow up. When I grow up, I would like to be a nurse because I like helping people get well. I would go to different countries to help other people. I would wear a white uniform. I would give needles and help perform operations. I clearly didn't have an idea of everything. And soon I would make my own hospital. I hope when I grow up, my mother will be proud of me. So those were my objectives as a young person. Then I met a real nurse and she talked to me about what it was like to live in nursing residence. And I decided that was it. I was never going to be a nurse. So I gave up that dream and said, I'm not doing it. 
But as I was getting ready to leave grade 13, my sister came home from university. She'd completed everything and couldn't find a job. It was a time when job markets were hard. And so I did something rather unusual for me. I applied to nursing school late. I did not tell my mother I had done it. I have to tell you, my, my whole family is nothing against healthcare, but they don't like anything to do with hospitals and uh, they, there's no healthcare practitioners in my family. So I didn't tell her and then I realized I better because I thought some letters might be coming back for me. And indeed of the three schools I applied to, one in London, one in Toronto and one in Timmins, my hometown, I was accepted at two. One was Timmins and I knew my mother would never survive nursing training. Um, she just wouldn't be able to make it. And so I chose to go to Toronto Western Hospital for my, my training. Now, I did often think I was probably the only student in that uh, year who kept having letters from her mother saying, you don't need to do this, you can come home. <laughs> so that was the style. But we, I made it through and uh, we were one of the, we were the first two year program to be developed uh, as they were transitioning from hospital training to college training. So my program was at Atkinson School of Nursing at Toronto Western Hospital, but we took some of our classes at George Brown in Kensington Market. And then gradually we were the last class, we were phased out of the hospital training program and it moved on to colleges and to universities. So that's a very brief personal interest in where I went from a young age to by completion. And now we're going to look at, I believe, the history of nursing. I think that's the next slide. So when we think of what nursing is, nurse also comes from the word to nurse, to nurse a child, to care for a child. And many people thought that women were the best people to do the work of nursing because it really is an extension of the work of mothers. Having said that, if you look at a nursing history book I have, they talk about the fact that in early era, particularly in, Indian, in India, men were nurses. And so it wasn't always the domain of women. And I'm going to just do a brief abbreviated history because we're starting with the Christian era. I'm in the church, so there may be a little theme here um, about how it developed. And basically uh, we started to have groups living together and caring for each other. And one of these were the Parabolani brothers from the third century. And it was felt that these were people who chose to risk their lives by caring for the sick. And so it was seen as something you took a risk on. It wasn't for everybody. On the next slide, we see further developments in nursing with the next slide, John Joseph, thanks, thank you. And it continued to develop in the Roman era. We start to see wealthy women uh, from the Roman era starting to do charity work. And so charity work and nursing work were combined. And among these were Marcella, Fabiola and Paula. Uh, Fabiola developed the first free Christian hospital and Paula worked on hospices and pilgrimage sites and taught. She said, we have to teach how to care for the sick. It wasn't something that would come naturally. We need to teach in a systematic way. From here, you go on to have further developments on the next slide. And we get more orders. And there are countless orders who uh, developed care of the sick, including the Knights Hospitals of St. John of Jerusalem, Knights of St. Lazarus, the Franciscans, St. Clair of Assisi. So the religious orders took on the work of becoming knowledgeable and caring for the sick. And in fact, my friend Erica keeps saying to me, oh, Betty, I'm reading these wonderful books about Brother Cadfield. Is it true? Were there people like that? And I said, yeah, Brother Cadfield represents an era and an era when they studied herbs and cared for each other. Some of these people were caring for people with leprosy. Again, risks associated with the kind of work that was being done. But the thought that this was a good thing and we do it to care for each other, for our brothers and sisters. We move on to the next slide. Uh, next slide, John Joseph. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, when I, when I studied nursing, <laughs> It's okay, I used to have students who would yawn in my classes and they'd say, oh good, they're getting oxygen. They just need oxygen, that's all that is. <laughs> the masks are good, I can't see if you're yawning, it's cool. Uh, well, I went on to school because uh, as we discovered in nursing, the rules kept changing. We had to keep developing higher levels of education. So I went back to university. I worked full time during the day and for the next 12 years, I went to school at night. And I did a bachelor's degree, but I did it in sociology because at the time it was really hard to do a nursing degree on a part-time basis. And also the universities would not accept 
that anybody who had graduated and written registration exams for nursing had any, any ability to move forward except to start at the beginning again. And I wasn't keen to start all over again. For one thing, they wanted me to have to do obstetrics again, and I hated obstetrics, so there was no way I was going to do that. So I did sociology, and every paper I work, worked on, uh, gosh, it had a theme on nursing. I did uh, aging in my gerontology sociology course. In my course on sexual stereotyping, I did surveys on men in nursing, and how did they manage that? Um, I even did a play on Florence Nightingale, Meeting the Modern World. So I just found a way to fit nursing, and I think my professors thought I was a little bit mad. But in one of the papers I did, I, uh, I decided I'd read and enroll in a feminist course, which was a little unusual for me. I was growing up in the feminist area, but I didn't have time to deal with them. But I thought, you know what, I, I'm a woman. I should, I should learn about this. I should go. So I sat in my first feminist class. We went around the room, and people said, what did you do? And there were two, another colleague and I were doing the course, and we said, we're nurses. Yet I thought we had said a swear word in that room. Nurses, nurses are subservient servants. They support a role for females is not appropriate. And my friend Linda Nice sat there and thought, whoo, this is going to be a fun semester this year. But in that, I decided to look at the role of nurses in the development. And I came across this uh, book by Barbara Ehrenrich and Deirdre English, which talked about witches, midwives, and nurses. And it was an interesting history because it looked at why did healthcare split? Why did it change that women who are often considered healers were not able to practice as healers in a proper way? Part of it was the church control of healthcare. The Catholic Church in particular decided that they could control and charge for healthcare. Universities were set up, but the universities were open to men only for academic studies and pursuits. In the original days, some women did train as physicians, but they were taken to task for it. And one person was even charged with practicing incorrectly. Her patients came forward and said, she looked after us, we peeled, we're doing well. But because they did well, she was also charged with practicing illegally because she was a woman. And so you saw that the care of, of control of healthcare changed. Now, the other thing that happened is many of the women who were healers in the community did it by knowledge of herbs and understanding. Sometimes they didn't get it right. Sometimes they used digitalis and the dose was too much so somebody might die. Sometimes they didn't know the right doses and did it correctly. But when the rise against witchcraft came, we're going to move to the next slide, John Joseph, and we're going to see that this was a comment made by a witch hunter of the era. For this must always be remembered as a conclusion, that by witches we understand not only those which kill and torment, but also all the good witches, which do no hurt but do good, which do not spoil and destroy, but save and deliver. It were a thousand times better for the land if all witches, but especially the blessing witch, might suffer death. So it didn't matter if you were doing good in the world. And we'll move on to the next slide. But what a loss of knowledge. No, it didn't. It didn't. It's fine. I did that deliberately. That's a trick of mine. <laughs> I'm going to give him a hard time. So I just wanted to point that out about the power issues in healthcare. And that is a whole interesting topic in and of itself and, and the way that disciplines developed. But it's one of the reasons why there was such a terrible split and the loss of knowledge when you consider all of the good blessing witches who were executed because of what they did for their communities. We'll move on next to the next slide, which is different. <laughs> and we're going to come to dear old Henry VIII, who did less for healthcare in England than Trump has done in the States, I think. But we can argue that one. But as you know, Henry VIII decided to get divorced and he decided to separate from the Catholic Church and he dissolved the monasteries. Now, who provided health care in that era? The monastic brothers, the lay sisters. So they made some endowments for hospitals, but not a lot. But the land, the land of the monasteries was taken and given to nobles. The, lay, the, the nurses and the lay sisters and the brothers that did the care were turned out of the monasteries. 
healthcare was gone. So we move on to the next era. And we'll move on to the next slide with that as well. Magic words, next slide. We then enter what's called the dark ages of nursing, especially in England. Because how did you fill the roles? Well, they recruited people from all over the place. And guess what? If you were a prostitute or a thief and you were faced with a jail sentence, there was an option. You could become a nurse. You <laughs> wonder why nurses got a bad reputation? It started in the dark ages of nursing. This was a time when hospitals became places of horror. And unfortunately, I couldn't find all the sources I used for, for talks in the past, but in my head, I carry some images. And one of them is a hospital where the patients were four to six in a bed. This would be a straw pallet, fleas, rats, disease. These were not good hospitals. The nurses, the people fulfilling their sentences instead of going to jail, didn't have anywhere to sleep. Guess where they lay their heads down to rest? He lay down with the patients and slept with the patients. So you guys are learning about how to protect yourself from germs this era. Can you imagine mm. how good were those hospitals in those days? Well, let's move on. The area is ripe for the next slide. And, uh, oh, we're not moving on quite. This is from my memory, but Napoleon also did an experiment in France. He decided to get rid of the lay, uh, sorry, the, the nursing sisters and the places where the sick were cared for. If anybody has ever seen the opera Dialogue of the Carmelites, it's a nice example of how the convents were taken care of and the nun, nuns were guillotined for their efforts. Um, so Napoleon's idea was let's replace these with lay people. And again, this is just a quote that stayed in my head from something I read off for one of those school papers. The lay people did it, but they soon said, you know what, this is dirty, dangerous, and poorly paid, and we don't want to do it. It reverted back to nursing sisters and nursing brothers, because there's something about this being a vocation of work that can be considered dangerous. And why would you do it unless you were doing it with your heart and with your faith? And so you see, again, a division of labor, particularly in the Catholic countries, where care often remained under the Catholic institutes. Now we move on to the next slide. And these are the developments post, I just put a list of these hospitals up because it gives you a sense of who they were caring for and how they tried to replace the care. So the Westminster for the sick and needy and other distressed person, Guy's Hospital for the incurables, including the lunatics, because you gotta get those people put somewhere. St. George's Hospital, here we get an inkling that maybe air is good in hospitals, country air, fresh air. And so they created a hospital for poor, sick and disabled in the country. Foundling hospitals because of the number of infants abandoned by children and they had to go somewhere. The London Hospital for the sick and injured poor of the East End. And Pat, probably you've heard of the London Hospital. Guys in St. Thomas, yeah. And another scourge of the... No, they were in other countries too, but I think in England particularly because they lost their, their care sources and they had to create something. But there, no, there were hospital Catholic hospitals in other areas as well. Um, the Locke Hospital, this was the big scourge and uh, pandemic epidemic of that era and that was venereal disease and syphilis and no treatments. And so people would have to be hospitalized for that as they went into terminal stages. And my last one's favorite, the Magdalene Hospital for Penitent Prostitutes. So oh, there we are. They have brilliant and wondrous names, but they tell you a little bit about some of the social needs and healthcare needs of that era. The next slide. It's also the man dominated the Yes, yes, especially at this time. Yeah. Now, now it comes along the parish nurse. Does that sound good? That sounds really good. Let's get parish nurses. And uh, this was a role that was created for wet nurses, for infants, uh, for caring for the sick. And it represented one of the most fee common female occupations in London. 12% of the London women were employed in nursing. Unfortunately, there are accounts about these parish nurses. Few of them were hung. Few of them were executed because they didn't really look after people very well. They took them in and they misused and they abused and they took money, but they didn't care very well for them. So our thought of a parish nurse in modern times is quite different. 
than some of these parish nurses in the old ages. And in fact, I guess the next slide, uh, John Joseph uh, will go on, has an example of a couple of these lovely nurses. Charles Dickens was known to write of them. There was Sarah Gamp, and then there was another one called Betsy Prigg. And these fictional nurses represented what nurses were at the time, much as I hate to say this. Nice, dissolute, sloppy, and generally drunk. The demon gin was on the streets, and along with venereal disease, gin and toxicity from gin drinking was a big, big problem in those days. They were untrained, they were incompetent, and they didn't really provide care that we think of as nursing care. They were considered brutal, they exploited their patients, and they had a total ignorance of what care was needed. Now, I'm not saying this is all your parish nurses, but certainly many of them had a bad reputation. And as I said, some were, were brought to trial for the atrocities that they uh, did do. Well, this leaves us a really open field. Do you think we need to improve something here, especially in England? So let's move to the next slide. Ah, my heroine, Florence Nightingale is on the scene. Born in 1820, she lived till 1910, 90 years. She lived a good life and a long life. Extremely well-educated. She came from an upper class. Her father taught her. She, she read the classics. She studied. She traveled. And she desperately wanted a vocation. When she traveled, she used to go and look at places where, where nursing care was provided, where health care was given. And she dreamed of being a nurse. But her mother and her sister were strong Victorian women who did not want her doing it. It would be disgrace. It would bring dishonor on the family. So why would they want Florence to do that? But Florence was a very strong woman, a very devout woman. And in the next slide, and we'll move on to the next slide, we see her going to an institute called Kaiserworth Institute. And the Kaiserwerth Institute she spent three months in was in Germany. It was a Lutheran training school for nurses. It was a Protestant based church run service. In answer to your question, did other people do this? Uh, it was largely based on the Catholic system of training as well. So there's a lot of back and forth in terms of how things were doing. And eventually Florence completed the program she did the practical work, she did the dirty work, and I'm gonna call it dirty work because there was a lot of dirty work associated with nursing. She did it all, she learned what was necessary and she had her own ideas from her large and diverse education. She went back to England and began to develop nursing in England, but the Crimea War had broken out and it was a mess in terms of how the young men were being cared for from the battlefield. So the war office invited Florence to go to the Crimea and she did. And here's one of her quotes and it was fundamental to how she cared for people. For the sick, it is important to have the best. So we'll move on to the next slide. So here she is, she comes into the Crimea and her description was it looked like four miles of mattresses on the floor with sick and wounded men. Liquid filth from clogged sewers was flowing over the floors. Cholera and typhus were among the other issues to fight with, not just battle wounds, not just battle scars, but disease and rampant disease. She met with hostility from the British army the doctors and the administrators. She had come, I believe, with about 30 nurses that she had brought with her to try to work in this environment. She made an interesting quote later in life. There is no part of my life upon which I can look back without pain. Healthcare affects people who work in healthcare. It can scar them. We move on to the next slide. This is her description of war and we are coming up to the Remembrance Day services when we honor. But remember Florence had to fight the British military. What the horrors of war are, no one can imagine. 
They are not wounds and blood and fever, spotted and mole, or dysentery, chronic and acute, cold and heat and famine. They are intoxication, drunken brutality, demoralization and disorder on the part of the inferior. Jealousies, meanness, indifference, selfish brutality on the part of the superior. So we see that she became known as a lady with a lamp. Now, has anybody ever heard of the lady with the ax? We think of her as the lady with the lamp. What a glorious romantic image of Florence going through the wards. Remember, covered with filth from sewers, people screaming, people dying, people wounded. But Florence began to tidy things up. She did not meet with help. In fact, some of the British military refused to let her have supplies. Now, it's hard to find the comment, lady with an ax, but I went to a woman, one woman play by a woman who studied Florence Nightingale and she entitled it, The Lady with the Ax. Because Florence got so fed up one day, she got a sergeant from the military, she brought him with an ax to the storeroom and she chopped the door down. She got her supplies. She did what she needed to do to change the conditions under which she was working, and she did. With her, she brought her concepts of what good nursing care is, and she had based those on all her studies. What a novel concept, fresh air, good food, cleanliness, hygienic practices. This is what she brought. It is the unqualified result of all my experience with the sick that second only to their need of fresh air is their need of light. That after a closed room, what hurts the most is a dark room. And that is not only light, but direct sunlight that they want. This is a time when they used to believe you had to keep all the windows closed and keep the stagnant air in there. Her thing was open the window and everybody was aghast. Oh my goodness, you're gonna kill people letting fresh air in. And when I read that, I, I was reminded, um, I got to work on our nursing archives at the Toronto Western Hospital, and I saw the book of nurses registered in the first class of nursing at Toronto Western. And there were little misdemeanors that they had done that they were let go for. And one of them was let go because heaven forbid, she left a window open an inch on a patient. Fresh air wasn't always felt to be good for people, but Florence felt it was. And we see her with the lamp, and we also see a more modern day nurse carrying the lamp. Because that lamp became part of the traditional school of nursing. We had many traditions. When I went into training, we started out with a white uniform and a white cap and blue collar cuffs. That said, I was first year. In second year, we took the blue cuffs out and the blue buttons, and we were second year because we had a white uniform. We had a ceremony to pass the lamp on passing the lamp from one generation to the next generation of nursing. And that came from Florence's nightly vigils of walking the wards in Crimea and seeing her soldiers and seeing them and watching with them and sitting with them. Uh, next slide, please. Now, another thing that Florence believed in, and boy, I really like this, because when I did my degree in education, which I did after sociology, I realized that there was a thing called experiential learning. It is a theory whereby we embrace experience, we look at experience, and we learn from experience. Florence Nightingale was a great proponent. Again, I couldn't find the quote I wanted, but she had said something to the effect, books and lectures are okay, they're fine. But above all, we need the experience. We need to learn from what we call in nursing and in medicine, clinical experience. On the floor, getting to know things, getting to recognize, taking what we learn from books, and turning it into living experience to know what to do. I was renowned at work for saying, you know, I'm coming in again today, but boy, I wish I could see something I'd seen once before. Why does it always have to be something new or a different curve? Because in nursing, it always felt like there was always something new you had to learn, never a time. So for Florence, she felt the most important practical lesson that can be given to nurses is to teach them what to observe, how to observe, what indicates improvement, what indicates the reverse? What's more important? What are the areas of evidence of neglect and what kind of neglect? And how do we fix what we're seeing through observation, understanding, reflection, and experience? We'll go on to the next slide. 
Well, I thought I better pull the human and it's getting pretty heavy. So Nightingale had some frustrations. She dealt with the army, she dealt with the sick. There was a war going on. But this was a comment recorded by somebody from the nurses she came out with. I came out mom prepared to submit to everything to be put on in every way. But there are some things, ma'am, there are some things one cannot tolerate to submit to. And what were those things? We'll go on to the next slide and find out. It's the cats, ma'am. They suit one face and some suits another. And if I'd known, ma'am, about the caps, great as my desire was to come out to nurse at Skatari, I would not have come, ma'am. And I just picture Florence in the midst of all this and her nurses complaining that their caps weren't very flattering to them. And I thought, wow, talk about frustration on frustration. Florence doesn't stop there though, as our next slide will show. And we'll just move on to the next slide. Now, what on earth does a crinoline have to do with nursing? Well, I have here a copy of Notes on Nursing, one of the textbooks written by Florence Nightingale. And in it, she comments among things about fresh food, nutrition, you know, good uh, environments for people. But if I can find it, here we are. Some of her comments, because they would get people called lady probationers coming in to help at the hospital. And the ladies would come. The fidget of silk and of crinoline, the rattling of keys, the creaking of stays and of shoes will do a patient more harm than all the medicines in the world will do him good. She goes on to also state in her comments, fortunate it is if her skirts do not catch fire and if the nurse not does give herself up as a sacrifice together with her patient to be burnt in her own petticoats. I wish the Registrar General would tell us the exact number of deaths by burning occasioned by this absurd and hideous caution. And here's a final clinker. I wish too that people who wear crinoline could see the indecency of their own dress as other people do. A respectable elderly woman stooping forward, invested in crinoline, exposes quite as much of her own person to the patient lying in the room as any opera dancer does on the stage. But no one will ever tell her this unpleasant truth. So I think Lawrence had some comments on what a good uniform would be as well. <laughs> what, what's that? She did wear a dress and a veil, but not a mass of crinoline. Um, and in fact, in a later slide, I think I have a picture of her with some of her nurses. But it was a, it was a typical Victorian dress, but not as flouncy and so on. So I, that, that, I hope that was a little bit of humor for you, although I don't know if the effigy of burning nurses is something you want to think about. But anyway, dangerous. It was a risky business. What can we say? We'll move on to the next uh, slide. So basically, Florence was a woman of action. And she went on to work with the War Office in Britain to change the military, to set up training schools for medical doctors in the army. She also was a great statistician. She collected statistics on public health and wrote recommendations. She uh, not only wrote about what they should do in India, but she heard in, in England, but she heard about appalling conditions in India. So she asked for statistics from there. She did not travel to India, but she offered recommendations and advice for how they could change things. She set up nursing schools. She did have lady probationers and lay probationers. And she taught and she began to send her nurses out into the community and they began to build more training schools and more qualified nurses. I believe the lady probationers went on to become what we call the matron in nursing. And then the sisters were the girls that worked under, the women who worked under the matrons. Now, again, some words from Florence. So never lose an opportunity of how urging a practical beginning, no matter how small the mustard seed will germinate. And I think once feelings are wasted in words, they ought to be distilled into actions. And she certainly was a woman of action. And one of her quotes is very good. I think it sums up her life. Were there none who were discontented with what they have, the world would never reach anything better. And we'll move on to the next slide 
where I think I may have mentioned on the next slide some of the things I have here. So as I mentioned, she also published books and reports. She had a consultancy role to parliamentarians. Uh, she was respected by uh, Queen Victoria as an advisor uh, in her knowledge of health care. And uh, she really was an incredible woman for her era. She rose above the, Amer the, the Victorian image of who women were. Now, in one of the other studies I read too, the time was right for Florence Nightingale because the other thing the Crimean War did was left a lot of women as widows because the soldiers who died left widows behind. And they were not of the class that would work in factories. They were not of the class who would do menial work, but neither did they have professions or careers. And what Florence Nightingale did was open up and bring respect to nursing, which allowed women from the new middle classes to have a career in a job that became respectable from the era that it had not been respectable. So she did a lot and is often considered the mother of nursing, the leader of nursing, but that's not to say she is, because if you look at where she came from, her skills came from the Protestant and the Catholic people ahead of her who cared for the sick, but she converted it into action and changed how we did things and how we practiced. So now we'll move on to another slide. And now I have to mention somebody who doesn't get a lot of mention, and that's Mary Seacole. And right now I'm in a book group, group, book group on the book White Supremacy and Me, talking about how people have been treated over the centuries. And I think Mary Seacall represents some of the bias of the past. Mary Seacall was a remarkable woman, again. It's not sure exactly when she was born, but she was born in Jamaica. Her father was a Scottish soldier and her mother was a Jamaican doctress. And in those days, they had the healers, the people who knew the herbs and who provided care to the community. And they were referred to as doctresses and healers. In her case, her mother also ran a hotel. And the hotel was meant to cater and give good food and good care to people, including a lot of the soldiers who were stationed in their area. And it was a very approved and acceptable business practice to run your hotel and do your health care from your hotel. And that's how it was done. Now, Mary became interested and studied under her mother. And she also rose in learning to become a person who knew how to give care. She traveled in the area. And she traveled to areas where there was cholera and typhoid. And in her life story, she is reputed to have done an autopsy on a cholera victim because she wanted to find out what cholera did to people. So she was very inventive. And as she said, beside the nettle ever grows the cure for its sting. She studied and she traveled hard. She didn't have what we would call formal training as a nurse, but she certainly had the experience of what nursing was and particularly in such things as epidemics of cholera and typhoid. Later, she published her book, Wonderful Adventures of Mrs. Seacole. So we'll move on to the next slide. Yeah. Mary Seacole was born about 1805. Um, so she's a little bit, born a little earlier than Florence Nightingale. She's a little older than Florence Nightingale. Uh, I was looking at it and trying to calculate it because she did end up in the Crimea. She went when she was in her 50s. Florence was there in her 30s. So a bit of an age division. There is question that they met. Mary Sue Cole refers to meeting her. Florence Nightingale is thought to have comments on her. But as with something I, I didn't point out, as with women's history, sometimes the history's lost. It's not been recorded. Um, and I'm going to come to a little bit of controversy over the thoughts of C. Cole and Nightingale in the Crimea, because you would have thought they would have met. So she uh, also decided she needed to go to the Crimea. She was in Jamaica. She'd been in England on a couple of visits before, but she thought she was well fitted for the work and described herself as the right person, for the right place. So she applied to the war office for the post of hospital nurse. She felt she could look after the soldier. She knew she had knowledge of cholera and diarrhea and a host of lesser ills. And she wanted to be there and she wanted to help. So she financed herself she got there. 
She did meet some of the soldiers she had cared for in the past in the West Indies, and they also helped with some financial support at that, that time and after the war as well. If we move into the next slide, her comment, and you see in here that idea of vocation, there are her years for you, Jen, 1805 to 1881. I am not ashamed to confess that I love to be of service to those who need a woman's help. And wherever the need arises, on whatever distant shore, I ask no greater or higher privilege than to minister it. So she made it to the Crimea and she built the British Hotel. She provided food and nourishment and rest, but beyond that, she used to go out into the battlefield with her bags of bandages and tea and whatever was needed and would bring it to the soldiers. Now, there was some question, she might have shown, uh, had alcohol at the hotel, um, but that was the business. She had supplies and, and provisions as well that she would sell, but she did, do great work in the Crimea. And it's attested to by the soldiers when she came back to England and she was in, she didn't ask money to help her. She'd raised it herself. They, they did fundraising for her and she became very well known. And when I was doing a talk, cause I'd never heard of Mary Seacole. She's not your traditional nurse. I hadn't heard of her, but I talked to my friends who were workers who had trained in the West and said, oh yeah, Mary Seacole, there's hospitals named after her, nursing schools named after her. In fact, eventually she was put into the curriculum of the uh, nursing system schools in England. But then there was controversy. People, some people wanted that name removed because she wasn't a proper nurse. A statue was put up outside St. Thomas Hospital. And some people argued that because they said, well, she didn't have anything to do with St. Thomas. So what you have is the difficulty and the dilemma of the social era of the time. Nightingale was seen as the supreme perfect woman, the lady with the lamp. And that was who people saw. There is some belief that she wrote to nurses of Nightingale to join Nightingale and they did not accept her. And Mary's thought was it was because I'm not the right color to go with those nurses. So there was a division, I suspect. And again, there's not enough written about it to tell us what that was, but there are researchers and people now trying to understand what role did these two remarkable women play? But to me, they represented what nursing is. Remember the witches of the era who knew herbs, who knew care, who had experience, but didn't have school training. And the people who went for the academic training. There's still that divisional spread sort of contained within the story of Mary and Florence. I'll move on to the next slide. She too saw war and her comments were, the death in the tr trenches touched me deeply. And when I woke at night and heard the thunder of the guns fiercer than usual, I create dread at the dawn, which might usher in bad news. Others have described the horror of those fatal trenches, but the real history has never been written. So I think she, I agree. A lot of history has never been written. And we'll go into the last slide here on Mary Seacole. And if I have time, I'll talk about me after. Uh, this was from a reporter who was in the Crimea. And he said, I have witnessed her devotion and her courage. I have already borne testimony to her services to all who needed them. And I trust that England will not forget one who nursed her sick, who sought out her wounded to aid and succor them, and who performed the last offices for some of her illustrious dead. Indeed, I think a very noble woman who rose to an occasion and brought her experiences and tried to alleviate a situation that was not a good situation. So, well, a little bit of levity. This is me at my best. I had many uniforms in nursing. Uh, I may have to explain one of them. I suspect I probably do need to explain one of them. But we'll go on to the next slide. And I'm just gonna interject, if, is it okay? Do I have time, John Joseph? Oh, yeah. yeah, okay. For <laughs> Not forever, I'll talk too much. <laughs> This is my short CV from my time of graduation, which was marked with the traditional long sleeved uniform, which I never wore on the wards. It was totally useless to nursing, but really great to graduate in. Uh, and our red roses, because we were the last class. So we graduated from Convocation Call at Uni University of Toronto as the last hospital nursing class from Toronto Western. And the latter picture is my retirement time, which seemed to have flowers again. 
and in which my colleagues uh, were very kind to me. I started out as a staff nurse. I did something unusual. I went into a unit. I didn't do traditional ward nursing. I went into something called the peritoneal dialysis unit, which is a treatment center for people with kidney disease. From there, I had a chance at a managerial job for which I am ever so thankful I did not get. I'd be a terrible manager. I would have been awful at management. But it was born in upon me that I would not go further in my career without education. I was offered a job as a research nurse. Won't tell you my bunny stories. I taught uh, the technicians how to dialyze bunnies and learned how to take blood on bunnies. It's a different experience, but it can be done. I only did that for about a year and there was an offer to become a clinical educator. And so I went back in to a nether day job as an educator, which was very good because then I could go to school at night. And so I spent many years an educator. Um, things were tight along the way when budgets were bad. The first area to be slashed in hospitals often was education. So I sort of came on the carpet a couple of times getting ready to lose my job as budget cuts occurred, but I seemed to survive those. But it looked like there was another one on the way and uh, they were offering something, a pilot project. They wanted to see if nurse practitioners could function in a hospital setting. I didn't want to do it. Didn't sound like me at all. So I let the first course go. I let the second course go. And then colleagues were saying, you really ought to try this, Betty. And I thought, I'm going to lose my job as an educator. Maybe it's time to take a plunge. So I became uh, one of the first nurse practitioners in a hospital setting. And uh, I did that job for about 17 years before I retired. And it was at a very exciting time because we were not quite sure what a nurse practitioner did. My patients would say to me, what's a nurse practitioner? I said, it's a nurse who keeps practicing until she gets it right. <laughs> <laughs> so when we, and then as you notice, Florence Nightingale comes in, let us never consider ourselves finished. We must be learning all our lives. And I devoutly believe we learn every day. It's what keeps us young. I'll go on to the next slide, John Joseph. Well, the heart of my career, although technically I really ought to say the kidney of my career because kidneys were my organ, not the heart. But it was a journey of caring and it was day to day, moment to moment. It was the concept of people living with chronic disease. I got to know my patients, not just from day to day, but some of them I looked after coming back and forth to hospital over years, 10 years, 20 years, and we followed their path. There was usually an inevitable end. The role changed, but the focus remained. And whatever I did, whether it was research or education or being a practicing nurse, trying to practice, um, patients were always my center. My challenge is in self-growth. And, and these, these were the real heroes for me. These were my heroes. And it's hard to tell stories about patients because you feel kind of some of them are very confidential and that can't be shared. But I thought of three people um, that I'm going to say who maybe affected me just as examples. And what they taught me, because we learned so much. Bill was the first patient I saw die in my dialysis unit. I was working night shift. We knew he had a bad heart. He had hepatitis. He was isolated for that. At that time, we, we did barely serious isolation measures because some dialysis personnel had died from hepatitis. So we wanted to be careful. One night I come in to look after him, a night shift actually before he died. And I came in the room and he said, Betty, stay away from me. Don't come in. So what, what's wrong? I got to do your blood pressure. He said, no, no, you can't come in. Over the night I realized we had a young nurse on evening shift and she treated him untouchable. And through the evening, she had made him feel like he was less than a human being. I was shocked. I spent the night with Bill saying things and we used to play cards when it was quiet and I'd say, I don't need my gown and gloves if I'm playing cards with you. I only need it if I'm gonna to touch something that's gonna be a risk for yourself. I said, look, it's night shift. I'm not doing any blood work. I'm not touching anything that's unsafe. Let me come in. And so by the end of the night shift, he was coming round. I was really hurt about the young nurse though. And I did have words after. The end of the night shift, my head nurse walked by the room, said, oh, Betty, we forgot. We need blood work on Bill. And Bill looked at me and I looked at him. He said, well, if you're gonna do that, make sure you double glove, do it right. I'll let you take it, but do it right. And I love Bill because he personified somebody who rose above the young nurse. 
He cared about the people who were caring for him to the point that he wanted to protect us. So when I walked in that last night shift and it's time to take his blood pressure and I got one line, but it was pretty low and he had to stand up because that's how we did it and I couldn't hear one. And I tucked him back into bed and I, I couldn't hear any blood pressures at all. And I knew we weren't going to be resuscitate him. He was only in his thirties, but uh, he had a bad heart and it had been decided we would not resuscitate. So I called the doctor, but before I did, Bill looked at me and he said, Betty, I'm afraid. And if there's a regret I have in my life, it is at that moment I thought, you know what? I'm afraid too, because I don't know what's happening here. And I often thought, I wonder if I had voiced my fears to him, if we could have talked about what was happening and comforted him. But I did the right thing. I got the doctor, we tried to do signs. We did what we needed to do. It was time for report. I gave report to the day shift coming in and I went past the isolation room one last time and I walked in and I took Bill's hand and I said, Bill, I'm, I'm going. And he started to take his last breath. So I held his hand till it was cold. And then my day nurse said, Betty, your shift is over. It's time to go home. I don't think I'll ever forget Bill because of the kindness he had for the people who cared for him and what a special person he was. Another person um, who also touched me was Elaine. And Elaine had a very serious complication. It was one that uh, we knew mortality rate was 95%. There wasn't any hope we were going to get her through it. It involved a type of skin injury, which I won't describe it, it was just bad. And I did a lot of dressings for her and spent a lot of time with her. We talked about things. She decided that if she needed an intensive care unit, she would go, even though the chance of survival was very poor. And she did go to the ICU at one point. It was a Friday. It was my mother's birthday, turning 93. My sister was here from England. We were going to have a nice family dinner. And four o'clock before I was getting ready to go, I got a call from the ICU. Elaine had decided to come off the ventilator. Could I come and see her? So I went up and I knew she didn't have much family. She was from out of town, but her mom, brother were there. So I decided to sit with them. You never know how long someone has when they come off a ventilator. And I sat for a couple of hours and I kept sitting and I kept thinking of my mother at home. And that's when you have serious problems. Where does your heart lie? Where should you be? But after about three hours, I went to the family and said, you know, I'd love to stay with you till the end, but I'm afraid my mother's at home and it's her birthday and they understood. So I went home. I got there. I had told them to have supper because my family learned if I didn't make it home for dinner, you eat. <laughs> it was kind of rule of thumb. If she's not home by six o'clock. Forget it. She's not getting there. Um, so I had birthday cake with my mother and it was my mother's last birthday. And I often felt badly about that, but I had the greatest mom on earth. She once said to me, you've been a good daughter. I know you feel guilty about everything on earth. I always say I created the Middle East conflict and anything else wrong with the world. If you got guilt, it's me and I will have it. When my mother said, don't ever be guilty. So I always remember that. We had a good birthday. But Elaine taught me some things in the times that I spent with her. I think I won't tell any more stories about people. There are many that touched me. I mean, Eric was actually a patient who... Uh, wanted me to go to his funky music concert. I didn't know what funky music was, but I went, you know, hey, why not? So I did cross those therapeutic barriers sometimes. But these were the people that challenged us to be better, to grow and to reflect. On the next slide. So I went into my final career path as nurse practitioner and I'm gonna tell you it wasn't easy. It was tough. We had no rules. We had no regulations. I was doing stuff that I used to think I was going to be arrested for because I think it was illegal. We had to create something called medical directives, which took us about three or four years to say what we could do under the auspices of physicians. And so eventually after a year and a half, I did what I called the famous crash and burn. I found I couldn't do it. I was feeling too guilty about anything that went wrong. I didn't know if I was the best person for the job. So I went to my boss and said, I'm resigning and I'm leaving nursing. And she said, no, you're going on sick leave. So I did, and I got counseling and I got help. And um, I struggled, 
I decided I should leave nursing. In fact, I tried to quit three times, but boy, did I ever have supportive bosses. They just said, go home, think about it, think about it. And then I put my letter of final resignation on a Friday night, and I came here to church at Manor Road. And the um, minister spoke of service. It was service Sunday, and what it meant to be there for others and to do for others. And I sat in the congregation, and I thought, I'm unhappy, not just because I found it going hard in the job, because I'm not doing what I enjoy doing. So I went back, and I went in on Monday. I said, can I tear up my letter? They said, yeah, come on back. And then I went in and continued for 17 more years working as a nurse <laughs> practitioner. We got through the hard stuff. We got through the hard stuff. So I'm going to say my life, a bit like nursing, for me is a vocation. It was a dedication. The last part of my career, 30% of my patients were people on dialysis who chose to stop dialysis. So I learned a new specialty. I learned about palliative care and end of life care. And I carry a lot of people in my heart. I used to say to families and I said, they'll never leave us. They will always be with us. And we always carry these people we care about in our heart. And they taught me so much about living, about dignity, about suffering, about living with suffering, about caring. So I'm going to try to lighten up a bit if that's possible. <laughs> and uh, I'll go to the next slide, please. So I won't go into this too much, but um, this was just, I was going to tell you about dialysis, but I won't. Suffice to say the unit I worked in was a world-class leader. We developed a new technique in dialysis, which dropped mortality rates from 80% in the first, uh, sorry, 60% in the first year to 80% in the second year to 12%. It was massive. And we spent a lot of time teaching others about the technique that was discovered. And I was proud to be a very small element of the team that taught nurses and doctors from around the world. This picture of the group is our first worldwide uh, nursing session on the new concept of continuous ambulatory peritoneal dialysis. We had nurses from the States, from Switzerland, from England attend. And it was an honor to, to teach them about the things that we shared. Okay, Derek John Joseph. Very good. Okay, I'll get the next slide then, please. Okay. So why did I get to be a clown? Well, when you go through any program, you have mentors, or as we sometimes call them in, in nursing, we used to say mean tours, just depending on how the day was going. Um, but Sharon, beside me when I graduated the first time from uh, U of T, uh, helped me forge my, my goals and what I was doing. But I always teach Sharon because uh, before Wheeltrans came out, we came up with a concept in the unit, or she did, that we would raise money for a van and one of our nurses' husbands had agreed to drive around the city at five in the morning and pick up our patients for dialysis and drive the ones that were coming off their treatment home because our treatment was a 20 hour treatment. And there's a picture of Dr. Ariopoulos there with myself and one of our other nurses and his two sons. Uh, Dr. Ariopoulos was the discoverer and well, I, he, he didn't really discover the technique. It was a technique developed in the States but brought to Canada and, and we really worked on it here. We had different equipment that we could do. Um, and my nurse manager, whom I love dearly, said to me, and another nurse, she said, we're going to do a fundraiser. Demetra, you're going to be the perfect professional nurse. You're going to wear your cap, you're going to look great, and you're going to do blood pressures for everybody. We're going to offer that at the, the fundraising table. So then she turned to me and she said, Betty, I got a job for you. And I was all preened up, ready, dignified, professional. And she said, Betty, you're going to be the clown. So I decided that nobody was ever going to recognize me as a clown, and I made up a costume. But apparently Dr. Ariopoulos' two boys said the best part of the day was watching a clown eat her lunch, because it was really hard to eat. I took my glasses off so I couldn't see what was going on, and uh, the makeup was hard. I didn't want to sneer. So that was my first and only adventure as a clown, because A, I didn't have any skills as a clown. And you know what? A, little, a lot of little kids cry when they see a clown. It wasn't for me, but there are clown nurses now. I've met a few along the way who work in hospitals. I'll go on to the next uh, slide. Well, as a teacher, I became a mentor. And I always, even though I know George Brown, Bernard Shaw is supposed to be misogynist, I still like his quotes and his writings. And he said, I am not a teacher, only a travel, traveler of whom he asked the way. So I was privileged to do a lot of teaching and education as a clinical educator. 
Uh, as everybody says, and Deborah will attest to, Betty never learned to say no. So when people used to talk to me about my career path and what I did, they'd say to me, what did you do, Betty? How did you plan your career? I said, I didn't. I just never learned how to say no. So I went to a session one day, um, Humber College was going to create a nephrology nursing program. They wanted some staff nurses of which I was one to come along and managers and educators. We all sat and talked about, wouldn't it be great to have a program? And at the end of the day, they said, write your name on a piece of paper if you're interested. So I did. They came back to me. I got to write the curriculum for a four level nursing program. I had no idea what I was doing. I wrote it with another person. They gave me the one for neuroscience and we created a four level nephrology nursing program. Money was tight, Ministry of Education didn't approve it. That was okay with me, but you know, we, we waited. Well, two years later, Humber called me and they said, Betty, you'll be so happy. The program's going to start. And I thought, yeah, I'm happy because I wrote into that program everything I didn't know and wanted to know. It was going to be the best thing I could ever take in my life. And they said, we want you to teach it. We've got 25 students registered in two weeks. <laughs> so, and Deb knows, I got her into it too. Um, I didn't know what to do. I didn't have the subject matter. I didn't have all the dreams that I had in there. So I asked the college, could they wait? So they postponed it to the winter semester. I rallied all the educators in all of the hospitals, anywhere where there was a, a educator in my field and we all built it and produced it and got it going in January of that year. Another regret, I never got to teach the course, take the course. I taught it for many years, but I, I never got to take the course. Someday, maybe. The other thing I did was I mentored others. Deborah, do you recognize yourself? In Halifax. Unfortunately, yes, yes. Halifax with Joan, and you did your first uh, presentation there, and you went on to give wonderful and amazing presentations in the future. Well, so, thanks for my mean tour. <laughs> so it was wonderful to watch people grow and develop. And when I started teaching classroom teaching, I would just, a nurse would put up her hand and said, Betty, you've just explained something I saw in my patient. Can I share my story? And it was like seeing these light bulbs go in, because sometimes you experience things, but you don't understand what's going on behind them. And to watch people say, I know. Now there's a picture of me surrounded by some Japanese nurses. And uh, that was a privilege I had. I, I got to be involved with some committee work, but there's a patient in that picture and her name is Keiko. The Japanese nurses had come to Montreal for one of our international meetings and they wanted to meet Keiko. She had been on the dialysis treatment that we use the longest of anybody in the world. And she set records and they wanted to meet her. And she was a brave woman who, I don't know how she did it, but she survived many, many years with dialysis and transplantation. Um, and the Japanese nurses were just in awe of her. She was like the, this on, on up there. And she was for us too, because she really showed the treatment could work and people could live. If I go on to the next slide. Okay. So I did do a lot of speaking and traveling because I did get involved with uh, international work. You'll notice there's a picture of me with the Mickey Mouse hat on. Yeah. They don't point out the risks of traveling and lecturing in other countries because your hosts expect you to do all kinds of unthinkable things. For example, pictures with Mickey Mouse ears in Hong Kong. So you did what they told you to do. You just had to go along with it. But I served for many years with the International Society of Peritoneal Dialysis, and I was a representative member for the World Renal Congress. Um, and I had phenomenal experiences in my travels and in my career. I'm going to point out just one though, which really kind of blew my mind. And you'll see me rather looking like a flower in the midst of the black and white outfits. I guess I didn't know black and white was the evening wardrobe for whatever. But this is a picture from Turkey in um, a meeting I went to as a representative for the World Renal Council. And it was an amazing meeting. It was to be on dialysis and transplant and all the usual things. But the year before Istanbul had experienced the largest earthquake in the world at that time, or one of the very large ones, 17,000 people had died. The city was shattered. The speakers who took to the stage, who shared their experience are people I remember. 
It was an experience where you heard about how the world came together to help. Where there had been animosities between Turkish and Greek people, there weren't any because the Greek had experience with this. Now you may say, what does this have to do with the kidney world? But when you have something called a crush injury where buildings fall in on people and they survive, they often lie under the rubble for hours and days at an end and they get dehydrated and they get filled with their body breaking down and the kidney trying to get rid of the toxins and the waste. One phenomenal picture was of a hand reaching through the rubble. And an Israeli doctor who was experienced and was teaching us these things said, it doesn't care what part of the body you can get out of the rubble, you stick an IV in it and you start putting fluid in it and you keep it running. This earthquake had the best outcome for survivors from, for people with renal failure. The Médecins Sans Frontières came in and I heard about them and their amazing work that they did and how they worked with the people. But I think the one story that affected me the most was the nurse who stood there and said, I was at the hospital. I didn't know what to do. It would be hard to get home through the rubble streets. I didn't know if my family were alive or not. And I had my dialysis patients who couldn't go home. So I stayed at the hospital without knowing if my family were alive. And I thought, we grumble and complain in our work field here, but boy, <laughs> that's a different world when you're there. Well, out of that meeting came the idea that, hey, we should do a seminar day and teaching us about how to manage dialysis disasters and dialysis. So I was asked if I would speak on the Canadian experience in dealing with dialysis and disasters. Kind of wondered about that because I thought, well, you know, I don't know, what do we do here? But Quebec had had the ice storm and they'd managed that and Winnipeg had had floods and they'd managed that. So I was able to put a presentation. I looked at what our federal government had for disaster planning and I got it all ready. And I did something a little unusual. I, I booked my flights without insurance coverage for cancellation. I booked them, I had three flights to go. I was gonna do a couple of flights speaking and I was gonna go home at one point. So I booked three flights one day and the next day I was at work and I saw the television. I, I saw the Twin Towers coming down. And I thought, okay, what happens next? And as you know, air travel was stopped. Because I was booked to go speak at a conference with a one day seminar on disaster planning in San Francisco. My thought was, well, if the terrorists hit New York, where are they gonna hit next? I think they'd go for the Golden Gate Bridge maybe. Maybe I shouldn't be going, but I don't wanna be a wimpy Canadian. So I texted all my, emailed all my friends who were coming uh, from different countries for the meeting. I said, what are you doing? Are you, you gonna go? What's happening? And they all said, Betty, we gotta go. We gotta go. Okay, I don't want to be the wimpy Canadian. So just shortly after 9-11, I boarded a plane to go to San Francisco once the airways were open. I got to admit, it was one of the weirdest flights I ever was on. I, I had a moment when I got my meal, and I mean, it was a pretty empty flight. And I thought, oh, they must have run out of um, the metal knives. They've got a plastic knife with the metal spark and spoon. And then I had a thought, and I thought, what did they do with the metal knives on those planes that were caught? in 9-11, gave me kind of a, a sense of awe. I got to the meeting, my colleagues didn't come. They decided maybe it wasn't safe to travel. So not everybody came, a few came, but it was a very interesting day. And we talked about what we would do for disaster planning and how we would manage in our community. We heard the talks that were scheduled to be given and we had um, impromptu sharing and discussion of other things. And of course, what happened in New York City, because I must admit in our unit, we were sitting waiting for the call thinking, there'll be crush injuries in New York, they'll need dialysis equipment. But that call never came. The survivors weren't there for those injuries. So I gotta say that the travel gave me experiences that I don't think they're comparable to Florence and Mary. They were pretty brave people in the face of very harsh things. But I've had some amazingly wonderful experiences because I never learned how to say no. So that's why John Joseph, when you said, well, you talk, couldn't say no. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll move on to the last slide. Of course, it's Florence Nightingale, my classmate in spirit. I love this quote from her. The first one, live life when you have it. Life is a splendid gift. 
There is nothing small about it. And in these times when we're living alone and we're by ourselves and we're trying to cope and wondering what the right thing to do, how to manage, let's not forget it still is a splendid gift and we can choose how we live our lives. The second quote is one that became more endearing to me as I faced my retirement because I knew I was getting close to retirement and somebody said to me, Betty, you're still young. You know, why, why are you retiring? And I could have gone on, but I took a little bit of an early retirement. I, I used to blame one of my doctors because we did rounds one day and uh, one of the young fellows said, that, uh, that lady we've just seen, her biopsy's not so good. She's not going to do well. I do, is she going to do well? And the doctor said, no, she's not going to do well at all. He said, she's very old, very old. With her age, she'll never make it. She's very old. So I stood there and I thought, yeah, well, that lady's a year older than I am. <laughs> so I said to the doc, I said, you know, she's not that old. <laughs> He said, no, she's really old. <laughs> so I said, you know, maybe it's time for me to find my way out of my profession. I've done 40 years, maybe it's enough. And one of my colleagues said to me, but Betty, there's still so much you could do. And I said, yeah, but I'm getting cranky inside. I said, I don't wanna be one of those cranky old nurses that you say, hey, I wanna get rid of her, she's such a pain. So I left while they still liked me. I thought it was a good time to go. But this quote I liked because it said something to all of us as we go through life. To our beginners, good courage, to our dear old workers, peace, fresh courage too. Perseverance, for to persevere at the end is as difficult and yet needs better energy than to begin new, York, new, York, new work. And um, I will leave you with one more quote. It's not Florence Nightingale, but it's one that comes to mind quite often as we face these troubled times. And as I sit alone and uh, my only family's in England, but I got good friends here, got good Zooms here. And I always think of the phrase from the United Church, creed. We are not alone. In life, in death, beyond death, we are not alone. Thank you for sharing with me today and letting me share. Okay. Do you want to leave the Zoom questions? Because you can see the Zoom people. And, okay. <laughs> and so why don't we start with our Zoom people and say, so Zoom people, if you have a question, put your hand up so then Betty can see your face. Nobody? Okay. Oh, I don't know how to do those hands. I don't know how to do that hand business. Just, just, put lift, your your hand, just lift your hand up, the old fashioned way. <laughs> <laughs> well, there is a way you can do a hand on these puppies. I've never figured that piece There out. is a way. Is that I don't either. Does somebody have a question? No? Any questions or? No. It's so just say with a comment. Comment, Deb? Okay. Just thank you. Thank you. I did tease you earlier when you gave me the invite. I said, Betty, I thought we worked on this. I thought I told you to say no, <laughs> but uh, no, you can't say no. And that's a blessing to all of us. Thank you, my friend. That was wonderful. All right. Thank you. And anybody here? Question, comment? Yeah, thanks very much, Betty. That's really interesting. Um, what sparks my curiosity is that you mentioned that you were going to be retiring at the What's that? Was Florence Nightingale the one who discovered washing? Yeah, like, yeah. You know, yeah. 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 yeah, I'm going to say that's a tough one. I'm not quite sure of the correct answer. I'd have to go back and look at the history of hand washing. Next lecture, the history of hand washing. How I, exciting I could that, that be? Part, I thought, I, I, <laughs> let me just comment here. What I heard, I mean, this is one of those, is, is it part of the story or not, was that prior to Florence Nightingale, doctors were not washing their hands between patients. Yeah. And what she did, she, there's actually a, one of the Hollywood films that shows that, and the doctors think she's out of her mind uh, because, you know, they, they were doctors and they were male, you know, and they knew better. Well, of course, Florence Nightingale saved uh, thousands of lives because of that. There was another nurse in the 20s who did something similar, and the doctors thought she was out of her mind, of course. But, yeah, yeah, yeah. but there we go. Yeah. But, no, I think, um, I, I think hygiene practices, because Florence really did work on hygiene practices. There's also Lister, though, and Lister was a doctor who wanted to bring hygiene changes, because believe it or not, doctors used to wear their black coats when they were working, and they were signs of honor, and they would be crusted with blood and God knows what. Sorry, Lord, I said a bad word in there. I didn't mean to do that. Uh, and they had anything on their coats, and they were so filthy and so dirty. That, that the suggestion was the reason why children were being, uh, babies were dying in, in birth was because these very filthy uh, 
clothes were worn near them. So hang, hand washing and hygiene, I'm going to say it was both physician and, and nursing practice, but I'm not clearly sure who it, but certainly Florence's idea was hygiene. Mary Seacole was too. In fact, one of the articles I was reading suggested that maybe Florence learned about hygiene from Mary Seacole because she was big on it. But I think Florence already had that from her, her previous practice. Pat. <laughs> 